So we will be in chapter two. We might actually get done. Yes, very exciting because we do go verse by verse, not skipping any. It's all God's word and it's valuable treasure. Here we will be at chapter two, starting in verse one. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called to the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This is the first of his signs Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there for a few days. Game on. This is the beginning of Jesus' ministry, and he starts out with a miracle. We see in verse 1, on the third day, We had been seeing all throughout chapter 1 that John is like day after day after day. Now here's the third day since Jesus started his ministry, but it's actually the fifth day in a row on John's account, starting with the Levites and the priests coming to see John the Baptist. It's all happening real quick. And here we see the first glimpse of Mary in the Gospel of John. Mary, the earthly mother of Jesus. It gives us an opportunity to clarify what Scripture actually says about Mary versus what other religions like the Roman Catholic Church and Eastern Orthodox religions believe about Mary. So that takes us to our teaching outline, and I have the little subtitle there, Something About Mary, because there's something going on in these other religions that don't quite line up with Scripture. And so I think it's important to go through Scripture to separate truth from error. Now, both of those other religions teach that Mary has a unique role and position of authority. And that leads us to point number one in our teaching outline. The Gospels only record Jesus addressing Mary as woman and never as mother. When others refer to Mary as his mother, Jesus deflected. This refutes the claim of Catholicism and Eastern Orthodox that Mary is to be worshipped and that she has a unique role in access to God. Both of those religious systems point to Luke chapter 1, verse 42, as their proof text for this special place. Luke chapter 1, verse 42, And she, Elizabeth, exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Now Elizabeth is proclaiming that blessing to Mary because she is with child, with Jesus. They look at that verse and they claim that's why Mary has this elevated position. They use John chapter 2 verse 3 as their proof text for their doctrine of Mary as intercessor. Mary discovered or was informed there's no wine. So someone went to Mary and then Mary went to Jesus and Jesus did something. He responded even though he said, What does that have to do with me? It's not my time. They look at that as Mary gets Jesus to do things that he wouldn't necessarily do. I want to just point out to you, and those who attended the seminar on Catholicism, this is a refresher for you. In the Roman Catholic Catechism, section 969, they refer to Mary as the advocate, the helper, the benefactress, and the mediatrix, which is the feminine version of mediator. The Rosary of Mary which is an encyclical and apostolic letter of Pope Leo XIII, wrote this. We heard uh, Pope Francis write an encyclical about global warming a few weeks ago. It's that type of profession from the papacy. This is a similar thing, but it's about Mary. On page 58, he wrote, Thus, as no man goeth to the Father, but by the Son, 
so no man goeth to Christ but by his mother. I'm not making this up. This is from the encyclical letter of Pope Leo the Thirteenth on page one thirty one. None, O Mother of God, attain salvation except through Thee. None receives a gift from the throne of mercy except through Thee. That puts Mary in the succession of mediator. The scripture says, First Timothy chapter two verse five in your notes. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. These two other religious systems say, well, there's somebody in between you and Jesus, and that's Mary. That's what they believe. Here is Luke chapter 11, verse 27 and 28. It's an explanation of what I was referring to where Jesus kind of deflects. And as he said these things, a woman in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts at which you nursed. But he said, he, Jesus said, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. So here's a flat out deflection. This woman, she meant good. She wanted to honor Mary and bless Mary and recognize Mary's unique role. And Jesus was, no, no, don't get off track. It's not about Mary. It's not about my mother. It's about those who do my will. We clearly see that in scripture. Number two. Jesus had half-brothers, and therefore Mary was not perpetually a virgin. If you look at verse 12 in John chapter 2, after this he went down to Capernaum with his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there for a few days. It's important to note that the repetition of the possessive adjective, his, his mother, his brothers, his disciples, indicates three separate groups. The reason why that's important is because those religious systems will point to the fact that Jesus refers to his disciples as his brothers after the resurrection. When Jesus saw Mary, he said, tell my brothers. He was referring to the disciples after his resurrection. And so they'll say, well, it was metaphorical brothers. This reference to brothers is really a metaphor, one of endearment, not physical, biological brothers. That's their claim. But the possessive adjective, his, being repeated, clearly shows that there's a difference between his mother, his disciples, and his brothers. I might say, I'd like you to meet my friend and neighbor, Jim. They're not two different people. Jim happens to be my neighbor and my friend. But if I said, meet my neighbor, Jim, and my friend, Jim, they would be two different people. Gets a little technical there, but I think it's helpful to see where in God's word this clarity is so that we can stand on the truth. We need to see another example of this. So if you would, please turn to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 12, towards the end of that. Because Mary plays such a central role in those two religious systems, we need to be equipped to answer those questions from those who say, well, what about Mary? That's why I'm going overboard on this, because it is so important. Gospel of Matthew, chapter 12, starting in verse 46. While he was still speaking to the people, behold, his mother and his brothers stood outside asking to speak to him. But he replied to the man who told him, Who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand towards his disciples, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. So again, there's attention being drawn to Mary and Jesus deflects to the kingdom and the focus of spiritual brothers and sisters that transcend biology. We never see any scripture to support the claims made by those two religions about Mary. There's no scripture to support it. There's that. But there's one more because they also believe that Mary has authority in God's redemptive plan for man. There's actually a move to proclaim her the co-redemptrix, that she is co-redeemer with Christ, that her suffering, seeing her son on the cross, was equal to Jesus' suffering in terms of payment for sin. We studied that in the seminar. That brings us to point number three. My hour has not yet come demonstrates that it was Jesus who was aware of his divinity, what his mission was, and when it was going to happen. In Jesus correcting Mary, it was clear that he knew and she didn't. 
We have to be careful not to go overboard in the opposite direction. Jesus loved Mary. He honored her as a good son, as a faithful son, as a righteous and holy son. He loved his mother with all of the love and respect that is due a mother. That is far different than elevating her to God's status to be worshipped and honored and glorified as a deity. Far different. So we need to have that proper perspective and not go overboard in the other direction. So enough about Mary. We see something else here, that Jesus turning water into wine was a miracle. Clearly, it was a translation of one element into another. But many call anything that is inexplicable or defies the odds as a miracle. That's a common belief. Well, if we can't explain it, it must be a miracle. That's not a sufficient definition. And since this is Jesus' first miracle that we're studying, and there'll be more to follow, it would be helpful to understand what is a miracle and what's not, so that we have that proper perspective. That brings us to this idea of miracles versus providence, and I'll explain what those are. But first, number four, God established the order and natural laws in creation for the purposes of providing consistency for man and as a backdrop for his miracles. Think about that for a moment. We need regularity and consistency to live life. We need to be able to plan. We need to be able to expect certain things. So there's this consistency in the creation, like gravity. Gravity is always the same. Imagine within an hour, gravity is half as strong as it was before. You jump up and now you fly up. What if gravity were to stop for 30 seconds? And you just kind of go floating up into space. What if you couldn't count on when gravity was going to stop? So you go climb a tree and then jump up and all of a sudden gravity kicks in, boom. We need that consistency. Gravity always has to behave the same way. The seasons have to all happen the same way. Forget about global warming. We still have four seasons, okay? And that's part of God's design cycle in creation. The passing of time. Now, we might think time goes by more quickly when we're older than when we're younger. And the younger you are, this message is probably feeling like three hours right now. (laughs) But time is consistent, and it doesn't stop. So we have this consistency in the systems of creation. We can depend on it. And empirical science confirms the existence of order and natural laws. Empirical science tests these things and confirms, yep, this is repeatable. This always happens the way it does. As you know, there's a lot of things that drive me up a tree. This is one of them. Some praise God as if the sunrise is some unexpected, miraculous event rather than the normal result of the order that the Lord established. Some of them are like, oh, thank you, Lord, that the sun rose or sun set, as if it wasn't going to happen. The next time they post something like that on Facebook, I'm going to ask them, did you not expect the sun to come up or to set? Or do you want to be sensitive to your surroundings and creation? There's a danger in doing that. We certainly give God glory because his glory is manifest in creation. Scripture tells us, absolutely. But we have to be careful, though. We don't appear to be anti-science, like, oh, we have no idea that the earth revolves around the sun and rotates on its axis, like science has demonstrated and could almost fall into some kind of pagan mysticism on the creation. God is the designer. He is the creator. He set these things in motion in a predictable and consistent manner. And that's giving God glory. Thanking the Lord for the sun coming up? Okay, I guess. But number five, a true miracle, I have to qualify that, but a true miracle definition is the act of contravening or going or contradicting or suspending the natural laws and systems of creation empowered by God for the purposes of exhibiting his glory. That is a solid definition of what a true miracle is. It is the contravening or suspending of the natural laws and systems of creation that are empowered by God. This has to be done by the Lord for the purposes of exhibiting his glory. Psalm 77, verse 14. You are the God who works wonders. You have made known your might among the people. For something to be considered a miracle, it must contradict the observable laws and systems. Turning water into wine contradicts those laws of physics. Giving sight to the blind contradicts those laws of physics. 
The Chicago Cubs winning the World Series is not. <laughs> even though that defies all odds, even though that is going to be unheard of for them to win the World Series, it's not a miracle if they do. There was a religious movement, and actually in the last few days I've discovered that it's on the rise and it's returning around a little over 200 years ago, called deism, that essentially says that creation was God's last miracle, that God created the universe and stepped back, let it spin off and do its thing. That was a common belief 200 plus years ago. Many of the founding fathers of the United States were deists. They were deists. They were not Christians, evangelical Christians, as we would consider ourselves. That was part of the common movement at the time. The most prominent deist of the time was Thomas Jefferson. He actually took an English translation and surgically cut out every verse that made reference to a miracle because he did not believe that those were literal miracles. He believed that they were some kind of figures of speech and it was symbolic. And that's what deists believe. And that is coming back into vogue last couple of days. Here's another element, point A in your notes about miracles. Whenever God chose man to perform a miracle, whether it's Moses or the Old Testament prophets or the apostles, it was always God's power working through them. They had no power of their own. All of the miracles that we see in in the scriptures were empowered by the Lord himself. None of these individuals had power in and of themselves. And true miracles are empowered by God for his purposes and his glory. But scripture does warn us in Exodus chapter 7, verses 8 through 12, and Matthew 24, verse 24, that false Christs and prophets will perform signs and wonders so convincing that they would lead the elect astray if possible. This is why it's important to understand what true miracles are. It's not enough to simply attribute every inexplicable occurrence as being a miracle from God. Because when those lying signs and wonders happen in the coming days, if God's people don't understand what a true miracle is, They might be drawn in by this lying sign and wonder, oh, that must be God. I can't explain how it happened, so it has to be from God. There are lying signs and wonders, and then there are true wonders. The lying signs and wonders come from the enemy. Point B, witnesses are needed when God performs a miracle so that the truth can be established and he can be glorified. That's why witnesses are needed. If a miracle happens and no one knows that it happened, did it actually happen? We see in Deuteronomy 17.6 that the truth is established by two or three witnesses. When we see the miracles recorded in the Gospels, there will always be witnesses. This is one reason why we should be transparent with others regarding our circumstances. They can observe and confirm the situation prior to God's intervention. There were witnesses to the wine running out. It was not kept a secret. They knew. Mary knew. Told Jesus. The servants knew. Servants knew that there was no more wine. There were quite a few witnesses. And then to be witnesses to God's intervention. Think about our unsaved loved ones. We witness that they are unsaved. We know that they are unsaved. And when God intervenes in their life and brings them to himself and they're born again, we can testify to that miracle because it is a miracle. It contradicts, it contravenes the natural laws of creation. For all have fallen short. All have sinned. That is the proclivity after the fall, that we all have that sin nature. We start out with that. Left to ourselves, we would continue on in that sin and rebellion. None seeks after the Lord. No, not one. So anyone who comes to the Lord is a result of a miracle because it contravenes and contradicts the natural laws of creation. Health issues, we see that often, even just in our fellowship. When reliable scientific instruments identify and confirm a condition and that condition changes without any intervening action, that is a miracle. When x-rays show broken bones and torn cartilage and all of those other things and doctors get in to repair it and it's already repaired, that is a miracle. That's not a fluke on the machine. It wasn't some house fly in the panel for the x-ray. No, that was an actual miracle. We've seen that time and time again in our fellowship. It's important to note that not everything that happens is a miracle. So although the word providence in and of itself doesn't appear in the Bible, the concept 
of God's involvement in creation within the natural laws and systems is evident in Scripture. So not everything that the Lord does is in an over-the-top way against the laws and systems of creation. Sometimes he uses them. Doesn't mean he's not working. And so there are two elements of providence that are generally combined together, and it's just referred to as God's providence. I think it's helpful to separate them out, and that's what we're going to do in the next few minutes. The first, number six, providence active, is that the Lord authors circumstances within the natural laws that he has established for creation in order to accomplish his ultimate purposes. So the Lord authors circumstances. God's active providence that controls the timing and placing of events that would naturally occur. Think of the weather or natural disasters. The Lord has control of the weather, and he can, if he wanted to, create a storm when it needs to happen. And we see that in Scripture. He's active, but within the natural laws. Sometimes we know when he's doing it, sometimes we don't. Most of the time we don't. We don't know. Some proclaim, oh, that tsunami was God's judgment on something have no clue. Those who made that statement have no clue whether or not that natural disaster was God actively doing something there, which leads us to number seven. Because not everything that happens is actively controlled by God. There's also a permissive component. Number seven, providence, permissive, is man's free will choice and results of natural laws are allowed by the Lord because they work towards his ultimate purposes. As I mentioned earlier, the Lord has these systems in place, natural laws that work on a regular and reproducible basis. And it's going along and they line up with his plan, so he just lets it go. All people have the freedom to make choices in how they respond to circumstances. You and I have the free will to choose how we're going to respond. The Lord knows how we're going to respond. He's omniscient. And he allows our response. I think a great example of that is Joseph in the Old Testament. Remember how he was sold into slavery by his brothers? They exercised their free will in selling their brother into slavery. And then through circumstances, Joseph was imprisoned. And then he was put in a place of prominence in Pharaoh's home. That was all God's providence, both active and permissive. At the end, when we find out that there's going to be this drought, this massive drought that's going to wipe out food, the Lord had told Joseph through a dream stock up because the drought is coming, the famine is coming, and then his family comes out of Egypt, destitute with no food, and Joseph is prepared to give them food. That leads us to Genesis chapter 50, verse 20 in your notes. As for you, this is Joseph speaking to his brothers at this reunion, dysfunctional reunion as it were, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So there we see active will of his brothers, meaning evil for Joseph, out of all sorts of bad things, coming to that point where the Lord used Joseph to save the family. That was the purpose all along. That was God's purpose. He allows things that line up with his will to accomplish his purposes. Now, sometimes the Lord allows our response to a situation so that we can learn a lesson from the consequences of that action. He'll allow us to respond a certain way. He won't force us to make a decision. You need to learn if you really learn the lesson or not. We often talk about testing our faith. It's not to let God know how our faith is, because he already knows. Testing our faith is to inform us, is to give us a status condition of our faith. Where do we need to improve? Where are we solid? Where do we have to grow? That type of thing. If we fail to understand this component of God's providence, we run the risk of repeatedly experiencing consequences and not learning from them. There's this belief, let go and let God. And that results in believers who challenge God to intervene in their own passive decisions. If God doesn't want me to have more kids, he'll prevent it. You know what the result of that is? 15 kids. (laughs) Because what's the lesson to learn there? If the Lord wants me to move to San Diego, well, he's going to pick me up and send me there. These are actual quotes from brothers and sisters who believe this. He will allow us to do these things so that we can learn a lesson. The Lord might need me to stay in the house today, so he may cause it to rain, so I won't be out in the yard. Now, that, of course, affects everybody else. I'm not saying that if it rains today, it's my fault. 
<laughs> Especially if you wash the car, don't blame me, it's you. If you washed your car and it rains today, it's because you washed your car, not because I need to stay in the house. It's a silly example, but he uses health and finances and job and home to kind of direct us where he wants us to go actively and, and permissively. And we need to be aware of that permissive element of his providence. We still have a responsibility to make decisions. We can't just, all right, God, it's all yours. You're sovereign anyway. Have at it. That's not what he would have for us. It's God's purposes that are the motivation for his providence. The things that he authors or allows is to work towards his purposes. So it might be helpful to consider one or two points regarding his purposes and kind of give us a little insight, help us to be a little bit aware, maybe set our minds on things above to consider what the Lord might be doing in our circumstances. We can't know definitively, but if our hearts are willing to receive that word from the Lord as to what he would have for us to do, what is he trying to show us? Wisdom. What does the word say about wisdom? Any of us lack it. If we ask, he will give it to us in abundance. So this could be a desire for wisdom in our circumstance. So number eight, God's purposes intertwine and interconnect with multiple people. We might tend to think that what's going on around us is about us, but the things we do and happen to us affect others. We go back to Joseph, and his journey set the stage for many to be saved. Everybody was involved in that mix. Even though it happened primarily to Joseph, there were other things in motion. At the wedding, Jesus performing the miracle of turning water into wine was an act of kindness extended toward the married couple. Think about that. There were 180 gallons of wine that were created by Jesus. 180 gallons. This was no small feast. Imagine the embarrassment of the couple if they had this large gathering and made the announcement, sorry, folks, we're out of wine. Very embarrassing in the culture to fall short of that. That's especially true in the Italian immigrant culture. Growing up, my grandparents and my parents, no matter who was invited for dinner that time, you multiply it by 10. That's, who, that's how you prepare. Eva's carried that tradition on, and she's improved. Now she's only multiplying it by five. <laughs> but that's the thing. You know, there's that overabundance. And when it comes down to, oh, we're out. That was the Lord extending kindness towards the couple to Mary, because somebody informed Mary. And Jesus could have told Mary, uh, no, go back to you, whoever told you and tell them, deal with it. There was a kindness extended to Mary. There was a kindness extended to the disciples. The apostles believed in him. Up until this point, the apostles that he drew was simply conversation. They met Jesus. Jesus told Nathaniel about seeing him under the olive tree. He was like, oh, son of God. This is the first action that Jesus took since gathering those few guys together. Now they're believing in him not just because of what he said, but because of what he did. God's purposes intertwine, interconnect with multiple people. Number nine, God's purposes are eternal in perspective. Oh, eternal in perspective. We often think about the here and now, but God is concerned with the eternal. We are repeatedly warned in Scripture to set our hearts and minds on things above, to set our hearts and minds on the spiritual things that are forever, that are for eternity and not get bogged down in the nitty-gritty and the temporal issues of the world, because we're here for a short time. How timely is it to be thinking about this in contrast or in the light of the Supreme Court's decision? This is the world's deal. This is what the world is about. I posted on Facebook this week a quote from 1 Peter chapter 2. We are just travelers going through this world. This is not our home. We're not of the world. We're, we're journeying home. Now, we have a job to do. The Lord has called us to share the love and the truth of Christ. But this is not our home. We're just traveling through. We're just passing through. And so we don't need to get caught up in what's going on. Certainly, we grieve for the world. But our hearts and our minds are set on the Lord and what he has for us and for that homecoming that's going to be for all of us who claim Jesus as Lord and Savior. The tyranny of the urgent. Immediate needs distract us from where we need to be. And it's so easy to get distracted, especially with current events. But with that, please join me in prayer. Lord Jesus, we know that you are sovereign in all things, and you do perform miracles. You are active in your creation, 
And Lord, we recognize that. We recognize that you are sovereign in all things, that nothing happens in creation that you haven't actually authored or permitted. And so you permitted the Supreme Court to make the decision that they did. This wasn't a surprise to you. This wasn't you wringing your hands. Oh, I I was unable to affect the court decision. No, Lord, you sovereignly allowed this to happen for your purposes. Holy Spirit, please minister to our hearts how we can be obedient and in line with your purposes for the world, for the gospel, for all that is to come. That we wouldn't see in the tangible, in the temporal, but in the eternal. And how you may be using this court decision for your glory. Help us to be in step with that, Lord. Use us in a powerful way to bring glory to you. Maybe not necessarily the same way as our brothers and sisters in Charleston, South Carolina, but in a different way, perhaps, in this time, Lord, that we can stand for righteousness and have a radical love, grace, and mercy, and forgiveness for those who are rebelling against you and shaking their fist at you. Lord, that you would soften their hearts, you would convict them of their sin, that they would recognize that they are sinners, that they are in rebellion against the God who created them, and that they would repent. They would turn from their rebellion and turn to you, Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, and that they would be born again. In the midst of this darkness, we would have many more brothers and sisters come into the family of God. For your glory and for our good, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.